to think big with the European Council on Foreign Relations. My name is Lykke Fries. I'm the director of the Think Tank Europa in Copenhagen and also one of the co-chairs of ECFR. We launched this series uh, during COVID in an attempt to encourage big, bold, counterintuitive ideas that have a potential to reshape Europe's role in a geopolitical world over the next decade. So we are not just here to make each other wiser. We are here to develop new concrete ideas. And to do that, we'll, do, we'll have Mark Lennart, the co-founder and director of ECFR. And we also have Ivan Kostev, director of the Center for Liberal Strategies in Vienna, joining us today from Paris. 16 years ago, whenever you say that these days, people immediately think that you're referring to the beginning of the era of Chancellor Angela Merkel. And 2005, was indeed the year she came into power, but it was also the year where I read a book which made me very optimistic about Europe's future, and that book was Why Europe Will Run the 21st Century. And most of you will know that it was written by the very same author as the book that we'll discuss here today. Today's book, The Age of Unpeace, How Connectivity Causes Conflict, is a fascinating read. I almost couldn't put it down over the weekend, and the only time I did, my puppy started eating it. But optimism was not the feeling I was left with, I must say. It was more pessimism, because today's world in the book is compared with a loveless marriage where divorce is not an option. It is rather a geopolitical version of the movie The War of Roses. And what is even worse, a new happy relationship is not in the cards. Uh, only some kind of flat sharing community or Wohngemeinschaft, if you like, where there are some kind of uh, rules for when you can use the kitchen or when you can lose the, use the living room. The core reason for this is connectivity. And it's not new that scholars claim that connectivity or globalization can be used for good or evil, but it is new, at least in my book, that Mark claims that it is connectivity that drives us apart. I quote, it gives people opportunity for conflict, reasons to fight each other, and lots of weapons to inflict harm, quote unquote. So Auf Wiedersehen, not just to Angela Merkel, but to the vision of the global village or one world. 
I must say, personally, I find the trust of the book convincing. But please, Mark, take us also on a personal journey here. When, during the last 16 years, did you realize that we ended up in this age of on peace? The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Luca. Thanks, Ivan, for joining. I can't imagine two people I'd rather be discussing this with. Um, and it's true that this book starts with an idea which is quite uncomfortable for many Europeans, which is the notion that the connections that uh, knit the world together also drive us apart. The European Union was founded on this notion that by binding countries together, starting with coal and steel and spreading out from there to a common market, a single currency, a common idea of citizenship, we could turn enemies into friends and we could create a level of interdependence which would make conflict not just irrational but actually impossible. And um, my own life is one which has been profoundly improved uh, by that ideology. My mother's family were, were German Jews. Um, my father was evacuated during the, the Second World War. As an eight-year-old, his father fought in the First World War. And if I look at, at my life, it's been immeasurably richer, more safe, more full of opportunity than any generations for 150 years before that. And I don't think I'm unique. But in 2016, what we also found was that many people, 52% in, in the UK, um, thought that the very things that I saw as opportunities bringing me uh, greater security, giving me life chances that other people hadn't had before, were seen as bringing vulnerability and threats uh, into the, their neighborhoods. And the whole idea of connectivity, as well as spreading empathy and creating all sorts of connections with, with the rest of the world, has brought uh, a, a sense of uh, polarization in its wake. It's led to an epidemic of envy as people compare each other to, to others and find their own circumstances wanting. But above all, has fostered this sense of a loss of control which people have in their everyday lives. So in that sense, I think that connectivity has created quite a lot of, of uh, competition uh, rather than cooperation, just because of the way that, that it pans out. Uh, both at the level of individuals, but most importantly, uh, within our national politics, which is increasingly uh, a, collect a, con a polarized um, sphere of identity politics, which is about reestablishing control. And that has led to an international sphere, which is also much more prone to conflict. And that's maybe the most shocking thing from a European perspective, um, is the way that globalization and interdependence instead of acting as a barrier to conflict, is becoming a, a new battleground for conflict. And many of its different aspects have been turned into weapons to hurt one another. And Luca, you use this analogy, which I use of, of a sort of loveless marriage, where the very things which bound people together in the good times become the way that they hurt each other in the bad times. But instead of hurting each other through custody of the dog or the family home or the children, now it's about trade, about the internet, about uh, the movement of people, or even solutions to, to problems like COVID or climate change, where people are using that to get advantage uh, for themselves to do other people down. So the book basically tries to do four things. One is to, to look at why connectivity creates this motive for competition rather than cooperation. Secondly, to look at the different battlegrounds where it's become a weapon, all the things which were meant to be driving the world together, these five kind of big forces of globalization, how they've become uh, battlegrounds. Thirdly, to look at how the different players are, are using the science of networks to, uh, to get power and prestige um, in this new world. And I argue that rather than a bipolar world, what we have is a sort of four uh, order, four world, four, sorry, a four world order, where you have these three empires of connectivity, the United States of America, the gatekeeper power, China, 
uh, the kind of relational power, the European Union, which is a kind of rule bit, uh, making power, and then a fourth world that lies be between them. And I kind of go into some detail about this clash between different ways of thinking about globalization and connectivity and how that's creating a lot of tension. But I end in a, in a place of hope, actually. I, I, I'm sorry that the book depressed you. It started in a, in a place of, of depression in 2016. But I think it ends in a, in a much more positive place where I have uh, this sort of notion that because all of the, the most wonderful things of our civilization come from exactly the same forces that are driving it apart now, we can't have a new architecture um, where we get rid of, of connectivity. So instead of, of trying to get rid of it, what we need is therapy to try and uh, make it more livable with. And I kind of argue that the big divide shouldn't be between open and closed societies, but between managed and unmanaged connectivity. And I have this notion of disarming connectivity. And I lay out, in fact, a, a five-step uh, therapy process for how we can uh, carry on uh, living together and how we can make connectivity less toxic for the world. And I think that that is something which is a really inspiring project for, for the European Union in its next phase as we get through, you know, two decades of, of integration and of liberalization and then one and a half decades of crisis management and disintegration. Maybe the next big project should be about making interdependence feel safe again and this idea of of disarming connectivity. Excellent. Uh, so basically also the core point here is that connectivity is here to stay. Uh, we cannot and we will not uh, sort of transform the world or Europe into a new North Korea. So the overall project that we'll obviously also discuss here today is how we then actually go about disarming uh, connectivity. Before I uh, turn to Ivan, uh, I'll just remind you that you can participate uh, in this call. You can use the chat and you can also, to make it even more interactive, you can also, when you use it, the chat, write live at the end of your question. And then we'll see whether we can actually then go to you live uh, using uh, this system. So let's, let's see whether that's also a possibility. And you can already start doing that now. But uh, just one more question before I go to Ivan, Mark, because I get the point also about the, uh, the self-help bit, and I also find that constructive. I also think there is some optimism there. But uh, to stay in the sort of a pessimistic mood, I was just wondering what actually happened to military power in, in your book? I mean, I get the point that uh, nuclear war is, is so devastating that uh, it's, it, it almost cannot happen. I get that point, but you could have other military conflicts. And I, I was sort of left with the impression that uh, isn't that a danger that things could spin out of control in that world of connectivity and where maybe, yes, we do need a therapist, but don't, are we, not also in a situation where we need a doses of good old realism with regards to military containment. I mean, what happened to hard power was basically the first question I would like to ask you. Well, the, the title of the book, in a way, is a hint to, to how I think geopolitics is evolving. So I argue that most of human history has been defined by this alternation between war and peace. Um, and uh, it was quite easy to, to understand when we were at war, they would, wars were declared, they were fought by soldiers. Um, most of the, the victims were soldiers. Um, and when they ended, you'd have a peace treaty. But it's obviously been, uh, you know, decades since we had a war like that in, in Europe. Um, and one of the wonderful things about the world that we're living in is, in fact, the fact that so few people get killed in classic military conflicts now. It's less people than get killed by suicide every year. Over the last um, couple of decades, it's been an average of, of 70,000 people, which is a lot. It's very painful, but it's, you know, it's half as many people as were killed by COVID in, in the UK. Um, uh, and um, it's, uh, in historical terms, is, is very, very low. But I argue that, in fact, rather than thinking that we live in this golden age of peace, we have to open our eyes and realize that underneath the surface of uh, the absence of war lies something much more scary. And that is this way that the ties that bind us together are being weaponized. And that that is both um, 
relatively cheap for countries compared to sending troops overseas. It's devastatingly effective. So if you look at the measures um, of, you know, whether people actually get their way, many more people get their way through sanctions, through um, weaponizing migration, <laughs> through cyber attacks, um, typically than, than they do by sending troops into other, into other places. But as a result, is also actually hurting uh, many, many more people than, than military conflicts every year. If 70,000 people are being killed in the military conflicts, you know, literally hundreds of millions of people are being negatively affected by these connectivity conflicts. And I go into quite a lot of detail on that. It doesn't mean that, you know, fighting wars will disappear. But I do think that the, 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 the danger of a nuclear holocaust will act as a ceiling on, on the willingness to use weapons between great powers. But there is no such ceiling when it comes to connectivity wars. And I think that is something which could easily spiral out of control with catastrophic consequences, both because people will could unleash, you know, all sorts of awful things in the world, economic catastrophe, cyber events which could kill uh, vast numbers of people, but also because of the way that they're weaponizing um, the, the, the big global crises like the climate emergency, like COVID. Um, and if those things become layered on top of each other, we could actually end up in a, in a cataclysmic situation because we have no rules to regulate these sorts of conflicts, um, it, which is, makes it very different from, from you know, both conventional war and, and, and the nuclear realm where there are ways of, of um, where we've spent a long time codifying them and trying to, to to come up with with laws which um, which curtail that competition, and in a way, it could mean that the world ends up going the opposite way of, of the way it went in 1914. In 1914, we had a huge amount of globalization, and that came to an end because countries fought each other in a war. The big danger now is that we could end up collapsing globalization because people don't want to go to war in conventional terms, and therefore unleash all of these connectivity conflicts which make interdependence and globalization so dangerous that they could either have sort of cataclysmic existential uh, consequences or lead to, to a process of deglobalization as countries find it so risky to be engaged with each other, that they pull back into their shells, neither of which would be a very attractive scenario, which is why we need therapy. <laughs> That's why we need therapy. Good. Point taken. <laughs> Ivan, now we go to, to Paris. I mean, it's no secret that you have worked closely with Mark the last uh, many years. In his book, he even sort of calls you his intellectual godfather. So nothing <laughs> like the good old, I'll make you an offer you cannot refuse uh, version. But let me start by asking you, um, do you agree with the main thesis in the book? Uh, that's the first question, but obviously there must also be areas where you disagree or where you have nuances to Mark's argument. Over to you, Ivan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. First, I really want to congratulate uh, Mark for the book, because this is one of those books that really connects the dots. We all know some of the things happening, uh, but there was not a story. And for me, I'm just going to try to figure out three things that I find really very important, but also radical. The book is so well written. Uh, in a certain way, you have the feeling that you are reading it so easily that people can really miss some three very radical points that are done. And all of these points has vast uh, uh, implications also for, for Europe and for policymaking in general. One is the thing that basically uh, Mark uh, uh, was just uh, uh, describing in his last answer. We are all thinking in terms of peace versus war. And listen, the story of peace is that this is not in the world in which we're living anymore. Uh, there is no, uh, the border between war and peace is very much blurred. And the more we think in these terms, we're not realizing what is happening because we're at peace and we're at the war at the same time. And as Mark, it make it very clear during the book, uh, we have the, the weaponization of everything. This uh, story of connectivity in which we till yesterday believed that interdependence is the source of uh, 
security and suddenly we understand that it can become the source of ultimate insecurity uh, this is a world dramatically changed and i do believe this is a very important starting point particularly for the european union because the european union uh, has its intellectual foundation the idea that connectivity interdependence are the major source of security so how we're going to live in a world which we understand that this is true but the opposite is true too that uh, connectivity produce not simply competition, but basically produce weaponization of this level of, con of connectivity and that it basically can destroy everything. The second thing, which in my view is very radical uh, in, uh, in the book, uh, uh, and which is also spelled very clearly, is that we now fear all the time deglobalization, saying, or we should fight deglobalization. In a certain way, of the way I'm reading Mark and I could be wrong, he said, what we see today, uh, very much deglobalization is the way to try to put under control some of these forces. So this is exactly how to manage some of this. It is not to fight deglobalization. It is not to believe that more convergence is going to be the end of our problems, because paradoxically, all these tensions comes not from the fact that globalization failed, but from the fact that globalization succeeded. The fact that we have convergence does not mean that in a certain way, uh, if we have more convergence, we're going to have less conflicts. And here I go on the side where uh, I'm going much more to ask questions. Uh, the, the therapist approach is very important. Uh, the problem is that who is the therapist? Uh, I was trying to see where is European Union in this loveless marriage uh, metaphor, and I have the feeling that we try to position ourselves in the position of the mother-in-law. Uh, the problem is that we should be therapists to each other. Uh, there is not an outside position that is going to allow this kind of a family therapy because we cannot agree who is the therapist. Uh, and in a certain way, we're in a very difficult position in which there is nothing more dangerous in any kind of a disintegrating marriage. And I should say that I know this only because of reading books. It has not happened to me yet. Is when you start treating the other partner as a patient. I don't believe that we're going to succeed if we're going to try to tell Chinese we understand of what you're doing because of this and this and this, or tell the Americans we understand what you're doing. This is not going to make the world less dangerous. Uh, in a certain way, the most important is to try to understand and explain to others what you're doing uh, and why you're doing this and what are the assumptions under which you work. So suddenly we have been living in a world in which most of the kind of policy positions have been very much implicit. We had the feeling that we agreed on certain basics concerning, for example, interdependence or globalization. And of course, there are different power asymmetries, there are different interests, there are value differences. Uh, but we can look at this. No, this is not the case anymore. And one thing that I get from the book, and I'm very much interested to what extent, basically, uh, Mark is uh, going to agree, is that in this new therapeutic reality uh, of world politics that we're entering, how we speak is becoming as important as what we do. Uh, and one of the major challenges for the European Union is uh, that because we have been such a strong proponent of uh, interdependent world and how interdependence is going to solve problems and not create them, we do not have the language. Other can much easier retreat to the real politic language, to the politics of a state interest. Nevertheless, it does not work so easily when we see how divided uh, political communities are, but at least they have the illusion that they have a kind of a reserve language to talk about politics and to talk about global, uh, uh, global problems. We do not have this uh, option. And from this point of view, how Europe is going to speak in this world in order to make itself understandable to others and what we are going to do in a world that has challenged some of the major assumptions under which our policy has been based. For me, this is the major challenge coming from this book. And uh, in a certain way, the biggest risk with the book is that it is so well written, it uh, reads so easily, that people have the feeling that they understand and basically this is a self-help book. But this is one of those self-help books uh, that are so radical in their nature that the first thing that we should do self-helping ourselves is to read it in its uh, radical nature in the way it is. 
Excellent. Uh, thank you very much also for reminding us that uh, Tolstoy, we can also say goodbye there because there's no more War and Peace book there coming out. We can hear that. Uh, I already have a number of, of questions uh, coming in, but uh, please uh, do write and also sort of remember that you can write live. If you want to ask your question, sort of they will go directly to you. But basically, uh, Mark, I heard at least one very important question, but if you feel free to... Oops. Nokia connecting people, uh, but but feel free obviously to comment on what you want to comment on. But I thought the the point about who is actually the therapist here is is, is very very important. And what's the role of Europe there? Hopefully not the uh, evil mother-in-law, although mother-in-laws are not always evil. Over to you. No, I think Ivan's point is 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 very profound. That basically you know part of what we're facing up to is the fact that no you know as everything becomes connected there's no way of staying out of there's nobody who can stand outside who can keep the peace who can act as a global arbiter on what's happening and that's why the weaponization of everything is sort of happening because every single point of contact that we all have with each other is potentially either a source of power because it can allow you to force other people to do things because they're more dependent on you than you are on them or a source of vulnerability because other people can um can bully you uh um, and put pressure on you and it's also why we're so stressed about how other people in the world think about things because we feel that they might try and impose their way of thinking on us and you know in a way that the best expression of that is in our relationship with china where we you know if you look at official eu documents now we think of china as a partner as a competitor but most importantly as a systemic rival and if everything um that everyone does is seen through this ideological prism about whether it's the same as ours then you know you could have a, a kind of never-ending systemic rivalry that runs through absolutely everything and that you know in a way um, is, a, is a success of, of globalization within the EU. We do think it's, it's a threat to us if Poland doesn't follow the rule of law because Poland is part of our political system and therefore it is a direct threat to us if, uh, if you have different norms which are becoming usual in, in, in the way that Poland runs itself. Um, and the radicalism about where we are at the moment is that if you look at the American debate on China, they find it a threat that Xi Jinping wants to run the country differently from the way that that, um, that the American constitution works. We in Europe equally feel threatened by the way that Trump was behaving. And that is a, a, is a, a sign that we're all kind of bound up together. And that, in a way, is why the, the therapy that we need is kind of relationship therapy, but maybe without a therapist. But we first of all do need to except there's a problem. We need to be curious about what's going on in the world. I think we were very blind to a lot of the problems with interdependence. Certainly within the EU, we could see that European integration made us richer, made us safer. So we didn't listen to the 52% in the UK who didn't feel that they were that they were benefiting. And that 52% has got its equivalents in every other single member state. Uh, but it's equally true of, of different countries around the world who, who didn't feel that they were benefiting um, from the last few decades. So I think we do need to accept there's a problem. And then we need to start establishing some healthy boundaries between ourselves. Because paradoxically, if you want um, people to be able to live together, they need to feel that they have enough space and control over what they're doing. And that has quite radical implications from trade to migration to how we think about culture. But it also means being realistic about what you can control. And that is maybe the biggest challenge for the European Union. If everything that other people do is a kind of systemic threat to you, then we're doomed. So one of the, I think, most radical ideas about European sovereignty is, is, is based on this notion that we can be true to our values. We can create a, a sort of uh, European um, uh, Kantian island where we can live according to our rules. But... Uh, even if other people don't follow those rules and that you know it's, it's less good than having a world run uh, exactly as europe you know above my head we have why europe will run the 21st century that was my number my scenario a was that the whole world would 
believe in international law and interdependence in common solutions um, and that we'd all be Kantian. But if that's not possible, better to have a Kantian island in a Hobbesian world than for, for us to become kind of Hobbesian as well. But in order to do that, you have these other two steps, which are self-care. So how do you actually go about rebuilding a consensus for that at home? How do you make your own system work? And finally, how do you make sure that people consent to, to uh, what's going on? Because too often, you know, it is presented as a sort of all or nothing choice. You can either have everything from globalization, from connectivity, or you can be North Korea. And in fact, if that's the choice, then you will end up with a, a massive revolt on your hands because it, it's not a fair choice. And there is, you know, a, a big dilemma about how we reinvent our political system so that people actually feel a sense of control. And I think that was, for me, it was the biggest shock of the Brexit referendum was that many people felt for the first time in their lives that they could actually affect something by voting to get out of the European Union. And that was enormously empowering for a large number of people and enormously disempowering for the 48 percent who voted to stay in who feel completely lost in their country now as well and it that shows the sort of the the huge difficulties of actually having consent because it's a question of whose consent how do you make sure that that those on the losing side also feel that they're being listened to that is something which um, is, is very, very difficult. Um, and I don't think there are easy answers. But unless you give people a, a sense of control, the big danger is that the whole system will, will, will um, end up being rejected and that we could then end up accidentally um, going back to, to a kind of earlier, much more brutal order. Excellent. Um... I thought uh, we'll divide the discussion into two, and I also I'll definitely also take some of the, the questions uh, that I already received and keep them coming. Basically, I mean, how on earth do we end up? Did we end up in this situation? I mean, that's going to be my first question in this age of unpeace. And the second part, I like to focus upon the implications for Europe, because as I indicated at the beginning, we wanted to develop new ideas and also focus upon the important sort of challenges, dilemmas for the European Union uh, at the moment. But Mark, when I, I read the book, I was sort of a couple of times thinking about President Obama, uh, not only because you refer to Hawaii, there's a section, very fascinating section uh, on that, but also because apparently sort of after Trump's uh, election, uh, Obama was was quoted saying, "What if we were wrong?" Also questioning the Democratic Party's strategy. I quote: "Maybe we push too far. Many people just want to fall back into their tribe." So, if you now in uh, 2021 you look back upon the last 16 years, what did the heads of state government in Europe get wrong? Where should they then have acted differently? So we did not have so we did not end up in this situation, or would we have ended up there anyway, disregarding what the European Union did? Over to you. Well, I'd, I'd love to hear what Ivan thinks, but I think you know there's both <laughs> a domestic <laughs> failure about um, having the wrong lens at which we looked at what success was over the last period of time, and I think too often what we did was we looked, we developed a kind of Esperanto economics, which looked at things from a pan-european perspective and you know in macro terms everything we did was great <laughs> the economies have grown people were taken out of poverty you had an enormous process of social and economic convergence uh, but if you look at it from the perspective of individual people you had losers as well as winners and we were too often blind to the losers and the losers might be people who uh were damaged by you know opening up their countries to, to competition to migration from from other places where you had more skilled people willing to work for less money they might have been people who were uh you know victims of, of, of the eurozone either of austerity or of um feeling they had to bail out other countries but there was not really a sense of the fact that there were winners and losers so that you could then direct resources to help the losers I mean, the, the UK was a, was a sort of classic example where there's no question that EU membership and enlargement was great for the British economy. But there were many, many people who lived in parts of the country where large numbers of people came in. There were no extra school places created. House prices went up. Wages went down in some areas. And nobody was interested in that. Nobody prepared for that. But then there's also 
as well as this kind of blindness to what was happening domestically, I think there was a lot of happy thinking about what was going on in the world. And, you know, I am maybe the, the ultimate um, <laughs> culprit of that with my book, Why Europe Will Run the 21st Century. We had a sense that we had stumbled on a different way of organizing the world and that it was so good that other people would inevitably want some of it too. And um, that ended up just not being right. We discovered that in quite brutal terms when um, there was a war in Georgia and then uh, Ukraine was annexed. Um, that one of our big neighbors wasn't buying into our way of organizing things. We discovered it as Erdogan moved from being desperate to get into the European Union to, to um, having a kind of post-Western approach. Um, and then we discovered it even more brutally when Donald Trump was was uh, elected in the White House, that even some of our closest friends who we thought we really understood had a fundamentally different way of looking at the world. And that's before you start looking at the fact that the Arab uprisings, which we thought were an attempt to kind of join the world of liberal democracy, were in fact, in many people's eyes, attempts to emancipate themselves from Western values. Or if you look at what's happening in China, where you've had this uh, extraordinary process of, of growth and modernization, which is leading China far away from Western models rather than uh, to becoming exactly like us. And that's been uh, quite a, a big shock. As the world has become more multipolar, it's not just done that in terms of the distribution of power, it's also become much more multipolar in, in its ideas. And, what's and your we didn't really know how to... Sorry. Sorry, go on. I'll shut up. Go on. No, no, go on. No, I, I just, I don't think that we had worked out how to engage with the rest of the world as sovereign countries that didn't want to be like us. We're very good at dealing with people who wanted to join the European Union and and uh, integrate the acquis communautaire into their system. Um, but we didn't really have a system for dealing with other people. I mean, the absurd thing is like 15 years ago, the way we talked to China was very similar to the way that we talked to, to countries that wanted to get into the European Union. We, we would do annual reports. We looked at how far they were going in line with our ideas. The whole idea of China as a responsible stakeholder, and it's an American idea, but it's very much in line with the European way of looking at China didn't try to understand where China wanted to go and how it sort of, it sort of it thought of itself. We basically scored them against the scorecard about what our notion of being a responsible power was and what our notion of Chinese interests were. And that is not a, a kind of a sustainable approach to a world where, you know, we make up such a small percentage of the of the global population and, and a shrinking perspective percentage of its economy. We, we're not in a position, we might be in a position to talk to Serbia like that, but we're certainly not in a position to talk to China, Russia, Turkey like that. Excellent. Ivan for a short comment, and then we go to Robert Cooper live. Ivan? Uh, uh, no, listen, I, I very much agree, and this is the major story. European Union, but this was not only European Union, it was the US, it was the West. It was a classical universalist view of the world in which we're seeing the world in its transformation and basically the world that is going to be very much like us. And in a certain way, this was happening. But the more the convergence happens, it shows that people want two things at the same time. They want to be like us, but also they want to remain like themselves. Uh, uh, and this created this type of uh, political tensions that we are seeing now and we should try to reposition. We should try to reposition not because we don't believe that what the world which we are building is valuable to us, but because we understand that uh, it can have a dark side and this dark side can trigger certain type of forces that can destroy the world as a whole. And I do believe this is the story and this is why uh, what uh, uh, Mark is writing really pushes a major rethinking of the way European Union was dealing with everybody, including Serbia. Because listen, even Serbia lives in the world in which if yesterday uh, countries were being proud of how transformed they are, how much they look like us. So now basically trying to resist and trying to show how much they remain like themselves is becoming part of the source of their pride. And from this point of view, Mark is quoting somebody whom I was also quite fascinated with, and this was René Girard and his idea of uh, basic imitation. This is really important. Transformation is still going to be there. There's still 
hundreds of million people in the world that prefer to live like us, but from the fact that they want to live like us is not the same as being us. And in my view, this type of, uh, so to end on, on this, European Union was based by, was built by sociologists. And now we came to a time for psychologists. Uh, and this kind of a transition is the one that I do believe should be also felt on the level of policymaking. learning one will have to say we now move on to uh, robert cooper are you there and are you in london or where are you in the world let's see where this works i can see you um, unmute unmute yes i'm here i mean excellent I've yep, been, perfect i've been Welcome. London, but not for long you're in london now we can start moving around again um, oh that's excellent uh, the floor is yours <laughs> i i wanted to say that um uh, I am at least as guilty as Mark was in a um, uh, rather benign view of the world round about the turn of the century, round about the moment when um, uh, there was, I mean, we could, you can could almost identify the peak moment. It was the moment when we really believed, and they believed it in Ankara as well, when we really believed that Turkey was going to join the European Union. And it's been downhill ever since then. Um, I, I am also, I think, guilty of having um, um, muddled the terminology. I'm afraid that the, uh, the talk of shared sovereignty, for example, and whatever the phrase was that I used, um, uh, actually, it's nonsense. Um, you, and getting the words right is sometimes quite important. You don't share sovereignty. What you do is you can share the powers that you hold as a sovereign. Um, and that's in practice what everybody does everywhere. I mean, the state shares its powers domestically by delegating them to local authorities. Um, it can share them internationally uh, by delegating them to a uh, uh, European Court of Justice. That doesn't, neither of those things stop it from being sovereign. Um, when the bomb falls, the crisis comes, um, everybody closes their borders if that's what they have to do. You're still sovereign. Um, and this has been, uh, uh, and I'm afraid that Mark and I helped the, uh, helped the Brexit camp by muddying that bit of intellectual, uh, the intellectual world. Um, I also, um, uh, but I also think that there's a, um, and so I think there's a kind of intellectual failure to understand exactly what that world was, and what the European Union uh, was, and a failure to a failure to understand that, uh, and a failure to explain that. Um, and that uh, has kind of, um, uh, and that has also distorted the way that we've dealt with other countries as well. So I haven't read the book yet, Mark, and I'm looking forward to reading it. But it sounds to me like you've put your finger on on something important. But I would just one, add one other thing, and that is um, uh, to act as a mediator, um, you don't need to be neutral. Um, uh, uh, actually, the greatest asset um, a mediator has is power. Um, the best mediators in the world um, are not um, uh, um, innocent, neutral people, though there are times when those can be very useful. But the best, best mediator in the world uh, is uh, someone like Henry Kissinger, who uh, made sure that the Yom Kippur War ended um, with Israel recognizing that they had only survived because the US supplied them with weapons, and, it, and Egypt um, realizing that they only got away with it because the Americans finally stopped the Israelis uh, in the war. So the greatest advantage you can have actually as a mediator is power and leverage and our interconnectivity if we are subtle might give us that as well excellent but, uh, uh, thank you very much <laughs> okay that's good that that that's part of the the overall sort of project here thinking big uh, we move mm -hmm. on to uh, luisa Vilashevich. uh can you hear us maybe i'm going to warsaw or where am i going to which part of Europe? Can you hear us? Just gonna wait for two seconds. Not yet. 
Okay, but I'll, I have a number of other questions here, Mark. I mean, there's a question about AUKUS in a world where heart power matters less. That was your thesis, uh, part of your also answer to my first question. So uh, will it benefit any of the new empires of connectivity? I mean, that overall discussion that we're having now on AUKUS, that's, uh, that's one question. Uh, then I have a question coming from uh, Germany, uh, from the SPD, from Johannes Ahlefeld. If all three empires start moving towards managed connectivity, do you suggest that we live together in perfect harmony? China has the most rigorously managed approach. Isn't that the case? So what does that mean for the model of management? So two questions, uh, and then we see what happens uh, with Ruiza. But if you could start with them, I would be grateful. Mark, over to you. Well, on AUKUS, I, I just wrote uh, an article about it, um, which, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't think that AUKUS is disconnected from the world that we're describing because, it, you know, it's about creating a platform for sharing high technology and also for, for controlling one of the, the central pillars of globalization, which is the seas through these nuclear submarines. But it's also about AI and quantum computing. Um, my worry with AUKUS is that if I'm right about where this big competition is uh, in the future of the world, that the most important elements are going to be, you know, these battlegrounds, which we discussed, um, of trade, of technology, of rulemaking. Um, and in those areas, you know, two of the three empires are, are the European Union and, and the USA. And if they can work together and define their shared values, um, it will be much to the benefit of, of, of the two of them. And what happened with AUKUS is that uh, it was done in a way which created a huge amount of bad blood. It undermined um, the attempt by Europeans to, to get more involved in the Indo-Pacific. And I, I fear that the, the consequences of that could be quite damaging to the idea of, of working together. And it, it would be a real shame from an American perspective if they traded the support of Australia and the UK, two very important countries, for, for the European Union, which I think could be vastly more important in terms of how this new world gets ordered. Um, but equally, from an EU perspective, um, I fear that the if we can't get over the bad blood from AUKUS, that that could end up as a, as a real barrier on the development of European sovereignty. Because one of the, the, the things which has made some member states suspicious of, of the idea of European sovereignty and strategic autonomy was that it was seen as an anti-American project. And that has led them to put the brakes on it. And I hope that actually people will understand that if you're a, a good Atlanticist as I am, then um, like the Americans, you want to have a Europe that can stand on its own two feet, that can be less dependent, that can be more of an ally, but also that can can look after itself where the US is no longer as interested in in, in um, being bogged down in the Middle East in, in European questions. Um, and that is something which involves growing up. But the dynamics at the moment are not necessarily going to help the Europeans push their sovereignty agenda forward. So that was the AUKUS question. Maybe Ivan should answer the other question about the three no. empires, because if not, I'll go on forever. No, no, you should go. No, you should go. So maybe we're just going to, you remember that question. We could try to see whether we can get Luisa on the line again, and then we go to Alexander Stoop. But then I'll remind you of the question about the, the empires. But let's see whether we can have Luisa on the line now, and then Alex Stoop. Mm -hmm. Luisa? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, we so can. Much. Wonderful. So, Great to see you. That's ama amazing. It worked. Um, so yeah. I wanted to follow up precisely on the question of sovereignty, linking back to what Ivan said about lacking a language to speak to and about global challenges. Um, and I guess this links also to Robert's question, because, you know, the Commission seems to have taken the ECFR's um, strategic sovereignty uh, agenda seriously, the S word is everywhere now, but I guess my question would be, is it believable? Is it believable externally, but also internally? Because I, you know, in this sense, I agree with Robert, we need to be very clear about what we mean by the S word and what we can mean. Uh, because if anything, you know, the the pandemic or attempts to govern pandemic risk have seen a renationalization of sovereignty. So how can the EU make 
its sovereignty believable, not just to external um, partners or contestants, but also to its own citizens? Brilliant question. The S word. Now we see whether we can have a Nordic voice in the debate. Alexander Stoop, can you hear us? Not yes. Maybe it's because we're going to Italy and not to Finland. That could complicate no, uh, matters. I, I think I'm, I'm, I should be in now. I was just let in. Yes, we can hear you. Hello. Okay, great. Violet. Yes, we can. Good stuff. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and uh, kudos, congratulations, Mark uh, and Ivan uh, and Lucas. Super interesting conversation. By the way, Mark, I still haven't received the book. So I'm, wa I'm waiting <laughs> for that. Now, uh, here, here's my question. It's my, it's my pet su subject. And let me test, test you on this. And it's a little bit along the lines of, of Robert Cooper. Okay, we are all, most of us, strong transatlanticists. But if and when we are in a tripolar world, I need to understand your fourth pole, by the way, you can explain that. But if we're in a tripolar world, which is to a certain extent dominated by the United States, China and the European Union, should not the European Union play geopolitics here? Should it not basically say that, yes, 75% of the time it will hold the hand of the United States, but 25% of the time it will play ball with China? Is this a sacrifice of uh, our values? Uh, or is it a real politic as we should see it in the 21st century? Excellent. And that was Alexander Stoop, a member of the board of Council of European Foreign Relations and former prime minister of Finland and tons of other things and now in, uh, in Florence. Thanks a lot. Um, so, Mark, so basically two questions uh, and I'll remind you of the third one. So the S word, how do we make it credible? Uh, both internally and externally. And then you had uh, Alex questions about the fourth pole. We need to understand that. And then also the question about realpolitik. And the first question was about the uh, empires, basically. If all three empires start moving towards managed connectivity, do you suggest that we live together in perfect harmony? And what about the role of China? Over to you. And then we're going to ask Ivan whether he wants to chip in as well. Mark, you go first. So, so yeah. Maybe I'll start with the empires because Alex was sort of asking about that as well. And essentially, my my argument is that what you have in the world is lots of different players who are manipulating connectivity and globalization. You know, Russia through misinformation, Erdogan uh, by using migration as a weapon. Lukashenko has been doing the same recently. But that there are only three powers who can try and change the way that the whole system works and that's the us china and the european union and interestingly they're all changing their attitudes towards globalization and connectivity at the moment in quite profound ways but they also have quite different ways of thinking about it so from a us perspective um, i call it the gatekeeper power because when the us looks at a map of, of global networks what it kind of zooms in on are the hubs those areas which are most connected where the most things run through and they work out how they can use those hubs either to shut countries in or out or to to spy on other players because um so much of the data is going through networks uh which are controlled by the the us where the nsa has kind of privileged access and you can see that from you know american sanctions policy to the way that it's weaponized the, the financial system in order to, to make the dollar into a kind of long arm of American diplomacy through to all the things that, that, that Snowden showed us. Um, the Chinese have got a very different approach. I call them a, a relational power because they tend to think about power in, 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 in different terms. You know, going back to Confucian times, the Chinese are most interested in not looking at the hubs or the different players but looking at the links between them and their idea of power is that you should have as many links between yourself as uh, and and the rest of the world as possible and make yourself as central to that system as, as possible and that's the whole idea of the middle kingdom which has taken on a new meaning with the belt and road initiative and they're fascinating developments in in the chinese approach to globalization there's a big debate at the moment uh, about dual circulation. So if the American debate is about, uh, you know, uh, about uh, decoupling and secure supply chains in, in, 
in China is about dual circulation, which is a sort of fascinating um, area. I think from an EU perspective, we uh, focus less on the hubs and on the ties between different players and more on the rules and the way that they affect the, the nodes in these networks. And we think of ourselves as a sort of rulemaking power. That's our obsession. Um, it lies at the heart of the way that we think about enlargement, but equally on, on the sort of global uh, level. And what you see is these different approaches kind of using the same terms, but meaning slightly different things. We see ourselves rubbing up against each other in, in different ways, you know, um, and, and you can see that a lot of conflict can come out as a result of misunderstandings between these different systems. I do think that as we try and move towards an idea of more managed globalization in our different ways, potentially that could actually reduce some of the points of tension between our, our different systems. Do I think that we should play geopolitically within the system? Yes, but I don't think it should be about trying to work out how we can be equidistant between China and the US or 80% towards the US, 20% towards China. I think we have to start with our own interests and work out what we want to do. That is the essence of sovereignty. And then work out how we can uh, push it forward. And if, if, that, if we can work with the US on that, that's obviously wonderful. It's always the best way um, uh, to do things. But if we disagree with the US or the US isn't particularly interested, then we might have to do things on our own. But I don't think we should be positioning ourselves in terms of our distance from other players. How do we make sovereignty credible? Um, I mean, you know, if you have sovereignty, you're credible. <laughs> if you don't have sovereignty, talking about it, in fact, does nothing but undermine your credibility. And, I, you know, I think in those areas where the European Union has uh, got its act together, it's been... Uh, very credible, you know, when it comes to to pushing back against um, uh, bullying from from uh, from other players on trade. The European Union's actually done a, a very good job of keeping markets open. The European Commission is very good at at, uh, at working out how to to stop people introducing tariffs against Europeans. Um, where uh, we've done less well is either where we're divided or because we don't have. The, the, uh, the ability to think geopolitically. So I think there is, um, because we're kind of thinking in market terms and other players are thinking in different terms. And in a, in a way, that's what our, the sovereignty agenda we've been working on at ECFR is about. We have this pentagon of sovereignty where we're sort of thinking about what measures we need to put in place to, to have control of our affairs, whether it's in the economy, whether it's on healthcare, whether it's on um, uh, migration, whether it's on... Um, uh, the technology, whether it's on uh, more classic security and defense issues, um, whether it's on, on the environment and climate. Um, and, you know, at the bottom of the pyramid is, is thinking about it differently. Once you start understanding that this is about power as well as about uh, wealth and about cooperation, then you can actually start to use many of the tools which Europeans uh, collectively have. But um, that is something which we're only just starting to do. And I think that's, you know, in a way, the biggest uh, cause of European weakness is, is the fact that we haven't thought in geopolitical terms in the past. Excellent. I forgot to say to Alex that it apparently takes time for books to arrive from Britain. It took ages for my, my copy to arrive as well here. Uh, Brexit. Ivan, uh, it's now, yeah, it's break. <laughs> That's your conclusion. Uh, Ivan, it's your final intervention. I think one of the most intriguing sort of parts of uh, Mark's book is the expression sort of make interdependence safe again. How on earth do we do that now as the European Union? No, listen, the first, uh, in my view, choice that we're going to face is a kind of a basic choice. And this is about the narrative, what is happening in the world. And we all now recognize that connectivity is weaponized. Uh, but then we have a different kind of an answer to what to do. And from the American perspective, uh, a kind of a certain type of a Cold War is better than peace. Uh, from this point of view, if you are going to have a major ideological diversion, if you have a narrative in which you have democracies against authoritarianism, this is one of the way to deal with it. Reading Marx's book, my feeling is that he's not going easily to agree with this, because the most important kind of a preconditions of the Cold War type stability of the classical Cold War was that Soviet and American economies, societies were not connected. 
So in a certain way, one story is decoupling and using ideological narrative to decouple. The problem is that we're not, we know how to live in the world which was not connected or where different parts have been connected just within their own ideological blocks, but this is not the world of today. And for me, here is the major understanding, and this is why for European Union, it's much more difficult than for the US. The first story is, are we go ready to buy the American narrative? And this is, if this is the case, this is going very much to define where we go. Uh, by the way, in this narrative, uh, Europe is perceived as a regional power. And this is why talking about uh, uh, Australia deal and so on, the Americans said, listen, you have a really important jobs to do in the European space. What are you doing in the Indo-Pacific? This is not where you can contribute. And obviously, at least some of the Europeans, at least France, is not ready to buy this. Uh, secondly, when it comes to technology, what is the meaning of technological or internet sovereignty for countries that does not want simply to use sovereignty as the way to keep the authoritarian system functioning, but on the other, they do not have a big technological companies that Americans or Chinese have. So if you're reading Mark book in this kind of a more radical way, uh, in my view, it means that we should uh, challenge some of the major, uh, major policies that the EU is taking now and try to say, okay, if we're going to face these questions, where we should stand on. Uh, and I very much agree with uh, uh, with Robert Cooper that this kind of a sovereignty, shared sovereignty and so on, creates a major, major misunderstanding. By the way, the biggest problem with the rule of law in Poland is not that they have a wrong idea of national sovereignty, but that they use the language of national sovereignty to justify the authoritarian turn of the government. And this is totally different. But we should be very clear that European sovereignty does not mean that national sovereignty is deprived of meaning, because COVID was the great example that in the moment of crisis, basically people has a kind of intuitive idea of what national sovereignty means, and they turn to their nation states. Excellent. Mark, your final very brief remark. What does this all mean also for the work of ECFR, of all people looking upon European Union at the moment? What should we set up? What are the new questions that you would really like us to answer? Well, I think, you know, the basic thing ECFR is trying to do is to understand the world as it is rather than the world that we would like to live in. And our colleagues are doing a spectacular job of, of trying to understand what's going on in the Middle East, what's going on in the Balkans, what's going on with Russia, with Turkey and Asia. And I think that's fundamentally important because if I'm right about this uh, and the dynamics of our connected world, we need to have much more curiosity about how other people see the world and to, to understand that much more clearly because all of our different points of contact could end up becoming uh, sources of conflict if we don't understand what's going on we're likely to misread them secondly i think we do need to understand much more clearly the nature of this new great power competition which is not being conducted as in the cold war between disconnected blocks but rather powers that are living together and Ivan was, was very articulate about some of the challenges associated with that. And then the third question is, is more to do with, with uh, Robert Cooper's question, which is about um, sovereignty and how do you exercise sovereignty? How do you have control in this world where we are completely bound into a global system, um, so bound in that the basic duties of a state to keep its citizens healthy, to make sure that they have a clean environment, that they can be well educated, that they can have a job, that they can prosper, that they can actually have some say over their lives, are increasingly affected by uh, global forces. And that's where um, I think we're going to have to to step up our work on the, the geopolitics of, of, uh, of internal issues. Um, and that's what uh, I think our European sovereignty work has been doing. And we're increasingly um, investing much more in thinking about what are, is the geopolitics of the of the economy and geoeconomics, what's the geopolitics of climate, geopolitics of health, of migration, of technology. Um, and I think that's where a lot of international relations is going to play out, but it's also where the future of legitimacy of our politics is going to be found. 
Excellent. Uh, so basically, we have an entire new work plan now here, not just for ECFR, but probably also for many other people following this, this discussion. And one of the core conclusions I take from this discussion is exactly the, the Cooper point that we have to look into our language, the, the, the words we use when we describe the, the new world uh, that we're in. So thank you very much to all of you for your participation, for spending your time with us. Now it is actually time for lunch, but you can obviously also keep on discussing because you can uh, just tweet about uh, the ideas about Mark's book and you can use the hashtag uh, thinking big with. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks to Mark and thanks to Yvonne. Enjoy the sunshine in, in Paris. I was told the sun is shining there. And do read the book before your dog eats it. Thank you very much. <laughs> See you next time. Have a nice time, please.